Good morning. Thank you to Sages for this opportunity. Here are our disclosures, and they will not impact this discussion. With 40% of the U.S. population suffering from GERD, this chronic disorder is one of the most common diseases of the GI tract, and the incidence is increasing. Increase in the prevalence of obesity and GERD have paralleled one another, and a dose-response relationship has been observed with worsening GERD symptoms as BMI increases. Fund application is the gold standard for surgical management of GERD. However, long-term data has shown higher failure than earlier reported with 50% requiring resumption of acid-controlling medication. Reoperative fund application is technically challenging with diminishing returns and data showing less than 60% success after the third redo. As laparin y gastric bypass has become the gold standard for weight loss, it has been performed with increasing expertise and decreasing complications. GERD symptomatic relief is widely reported following ruin y and some series show relief in more than 95% of cases. This has brought about the consideration that ruin y may be the best operation for anti-reflux failure. Our objective was to evaluate long-term outcomes performing ruin y following failed fund application. We have previously reported our findings and have increased follow-up as well as our experience in the non-obese and with the utilization of the robot. We performed a prospective study of all patients undergoing RUIN-Y following failed fund application. Outcomes were compared between obese and non-obese patients, as well as laparoscopic technique and robotic technique. We had 87 patients. The median BMI for the whole cohort was 32. We had 60 obese and 27 non-obese. BMIs were 35 and 27, respectively. 16% of our patients had undergone a previous open procedure. Their comorbidities are seen here. Their preoperative symptoms since their last anti-reflux surgery was reflux, dysphagia, abdominal pain, and regurgitation. The median symptom-free interval since last procedure was three years. Aside from a history physical and reviewing of the previous OR records, we performed EGD and upper GI in all patients. We saw hiatal hernia, slipped fund application, Manometry was performed selectively with 11 having decreased esophageal motility, five hypotonic um, sphincters. Gastric emptying was also performed selectively with four pa 14 patients showing delayed gastric emptying. The procedure was performed by three separate surgeons. Um, there's some distinctions between the procedure, but in general it began with takedown of fund application uh, confirmed with intraoperative EGD creation of a 30 to 50 cc gastric pouch, uh, 60 to 150 rule limb, according to the patient's pre-op BMI, as well as according to the surgeon's preference, anticholic anti-gastric GJ anastomosis, and one surgeon utilized robotic assistance, predominantly for the hiatal adhesiolysis, the takedown of the fundification, uh, G his GJ anastomosis, and curl repair. 41 of our cases were laparoscopic, 39 robotic, Seven were open, two of which were planned, and five were lap conversions. Intraoperatively, we found 74 hiatal hernias, 30 intrathoracic migration of the wrap, 28 slipped, and 12 complete disruptions. One surgeon placed all 11 of the G-tubes intraoperatively at their discretion. Intraoperative complications were four gastric perforations, um, three of which were in the fundus and resected, one of which on the greater curvature, which was sutured and repaired, and one esophageal perforation, which was seen at the time of dissection. Here's the operative length. Uh, robotic was 375 minutes, and lap was 332. And when comparing lap versus robotic, there was no difference in age, BMI, EBL. However, operative time was longer for the robotic, although robotic did have a shorter length of stay by one day. Postoperatively, there was 10 reoperations three early SBOs, two anastomotic leaks, three internal hernias, and two incisional hernias, which required um, return to the operating room. Three patients were managed um, with endoscopic management for an anastomotic bleed and two anastomotic strictures. We had four readmissions within 30 days of discharge for vomiting and dehydration in three patients and melana in one. The 27 non-obese patients, their median BMI was 27.5. They presented with no difference in rates of reflux, pain, dysphagia, or respiratory complaints compared to the obese. Here were their findings, and an average rule limb length was 88 centimeters. 
The follow-up for the whole cohort was 32 months. 87% of the patients returned with resolution of symptoms. All 11 G-tubes were removed within one month of surgery. The current BMI for the non-obese, 22.1. The current BMI for the obese is 27.5. We had 78% um, excess weight loss in the obese and 83% in the non-obese. One non-obese patient has returned with recurrence of reflux compared to 10 in the obese group. Of the 60 obese patients, 37 are no longer obese with 20 overweight and 17 at a BMI between 18 and 24. 27 non-obese, one now has a BMI of 30, three remain overweight, and 23 have normal BMI. The 11 patients who have recurrence of symptoms, 11, all 11 have undergone EGD, two of which we've seen GJ and anastomotic stricture, which was relieved with dilation. Four patients had EGD and upper GI showing no signs of reflux. However, they're on medication, which has caused symptomatic control. And five of the patients had normal EGD, but are having difficulty following the ruin wide by bypass diet. One patient's continued tobacco use and said use and developed a marginal ulcer. In conclusion, uh, the ruin Y following failed fundoplication is successful in both obese patients, successful in non-obese patients with 80% um, excess weight loss. 23% of the obese now have a normal BMI with 85% of the non-obese. However, given the five of 11 patients with symptomatic recurrence, having issues with the dietary and lifestyle issues, it underlines the importance of this counseling prior to the operation and at follow-up. Thank you.